It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello and welcome to Accelerate. We're back with our guest, Jim Keenan, or Keenan as he likes to be known, who's just written this great book, Not Taught. This is part two of our conversation. If you didn't hear part one, you need to go back, listen to that, come back to this, because it's all part and parcel of one great review of what he's written, which is really about the, the new rule book, or the new playbook, if you will, for success in the 21st century. So Jim, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you, thank you. Having fun. All right, Keenan, welcome back to the show. Gosh, I see I... I'm so polite, you know, I have this thing about calling people by their last name. Don't even stress it, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, I'm not stressed about it. <laughs> so, yeah, we talked about, in the first episode, about education, and, you know, you talked about the value of a college degree, and it wasn't, we were devaluing the value of the education, it was just possibly that piece of paper itself, you know, you still need to be educated and an expert, no matter how you acquire that knowledge, but... One point I wanted to talk about, which is, you know, the common thread throughout here is I think that so oftentimes people think that in this digital world that somehow it makes it easier, right? That you don't have to work quite as hard. You don't have to be quite as determined. And and I think you think differently. Yeah, yes. You know, what's funny is I was writing the book. I, I, I kept saying, hey, you get to be successful, do this. And those who are successful, do this. And it dawned on me that I wanted to make it be real clear that the traditional foundation foundational elements of success have not changed. The idea of determination, hard work, grit, that, look, that will never change, right? That, that, at the end of the day, that's the foundation. But where you focus that work, where you focus that hard work, that drive, that determination, that grit, that has changed. And if you don't know where you're focusing it to, it doesn't matter if I have a flashlight in the woods. If I'm not focusing it in the right direction, it's not going to help me. And this is the same thing here. So what I talk about here isn't, and this isn't another book on, hey, work hard, bust your butt, you can do it, you have all the choices, yeah, you go. It's, hey, if you already work hard, you're committed to work hard, great, but I want to make sure you're focused on the right things using the flashlight. I want to make sure that you are driving that hard work, that grit and determination, where it will have the greatest return. And that's what this is about. Well, I think the other thing that's important about this grit and determination and hard work is that you know, more so than ever, we are a nation of free agents, right? More and more people working for themselves or working as contractors for big companies, but that their success more than ever is really tied directly to their willingness to work hard, the amount of hours they're willing to put in. I mean, you want to work smart, and this information age certainly facilitates that, but working hard, God, it's just, you can't do without it. No, and more, no. more important than ever, I think. Yeah, you, you nailed it. You, you absolutely nailed it. We are more and more... Um, being uh, our success is more and more tied to our ability to get stuff done. We talk about, I have a uh, chapter here called time versus results, which you just sort of referenced and we'll get to, but look, the idea of going, we all know this, everybody knows this already. The idea of going to a company and just doing your job and staying there for 40 years and retiring is gone. It's gone. And so you have to rely more and more on your ability to differentiate yourself, more and more on your ability to demonstrate why you as a product are better than the guy next to you and why you deserve this job better than the girl next to you and why you deserve the promotion better. You have to deliver on those merits more and more than ever, whether as a consultant or, or switching jobs or whatever. So you nailed it. It's, it's more imperative in the 21st century than it was to be able to sell, market, and build yourself. Right, and so part of that, excuse me, part of that key element of being able to put yourself in position to differentiate yourself has to do with this concept of creating reach that you talk about, reach and influence, which we touched on right before the end of the last the last talk, so the last episode. So, what is this reach that you talk about? Let's define it for people so they understand it, and what's really encompasses it. Yeah, so look, reach is powerful. So, reach. Is, think about it this way: reach is the ability to influence. Each you have, if you will, the more people you can influence. And the more people you can influence, the more opportunities you can create, the more things you can make happen. Reach is a powerful asset. 
a powerful asset. I mean, we talked in, in the 21st, I'm sorry, in the 20th century, in the industrial age, we talked about people's Rolodexes. Remember we talked about- Yeah, yeah we're Rolodex, right? And the word we use back then is the network. And we all agree that the person with the biggest network was, the, you know, was in sales and he was one of the more successful people because they knew more people. They could make more phone calls. They could call in more favors, right? Well, those days was a one-to-one -one type of thing. And it, it, if you had, if you could get to 100 back in those days, you were the bomb, right? But now with social media and LinkedIn and all of the access to people and information, you would better have real measurable influence or reach into the tune of thousands or you, you're just not competing which means you have to leverage these tools and you have to do things different if you think you're going to be successful in the 21st century with a rolodex that includes the people you've worked with in the past your neighbors the buddy at the squash club and the dude you play basketball with or the, or the women you um, play soccer with on the weekends you're done you are done you're toast it's too small of a number now. You have to have massive reach. Right. And so part of the, or really the key, not really the part, but I think the foundation of then building this reach is not so much, you know, people think it's about making connections, you know, personal connections like the old networking, but it's really not. It's about what you stand for. Yes. No, and, yes. So, and so so that's, that's the basis of forming this network and these connections and your reach. It's about telling people who you are and what you stand for. Yes, it's your brand. Right after the first chapter in this book is called Reach, and I, I go into intense detail about the value of Reach and how it drove this world before um, the internet, the information age, and how people made hundreds of millions and the equivalent of billions of dollars, say, like William Randolph Hearst and the television stations and Michael Jordan. And I, and I say, hey, guess what? Now you can build your own Reach like that. But right after that, the very next chapter is Brand You. Because in order to build reach, you have to have a personalized brand that people value, that talks about the value you bring. What is your brand? Because if we really think about it, whether you're buying a newspaper, whether you're listening to music, whether you're watching a TV show, whether you're reading a book, like if someone chooses to read this book and buy this book, it's going to come down to the perceived value, right? Mm -hmm. And so as an individual, for the first time in history of man, we have more tools and more outlets and more distribution channels to celebrate and to promote our brand. But if we don't build one, we, we're promoting air. So we have to be deliberate now in identifying ourselves with an identity, with a brand identity around what value we bring as a salesperson, as a podcast like here, Andy, as an artist, as a school principal, as whatever it is I, whatever it is I do, I have to build a brand around that that differentiates me from all the other high school principals, from all the other salespeople, from all the other art directors. If I can't do that, I'm in serious trouble. Well, so if you're, let's use sales as an example, because you know, we're very familiar with that one, obviously, is that if a prospect you know, first interacts with you, what's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to Google you. They're going to go to LinkedIn, yeah. and they're going to find everything about you that's out there. Well, if you're a blank slate you're not inspiring any sort of confidence in them that you can bring any value to them. Oh, Andy, you, you couldn't say that anybody. You're not inspiring any confidence if they can't find you. I call it digital obscurity, and I, I coined this phrase, or I was coined as a stretch, but I have this phrase in the book that says, digital obscurity will be the plague of the commoner in the 21st century. If every year that goes by, if you can't be found when somebody does a search for your name, and you can't be found and associated with what you do, then you are so far behind the eight ball and you're in serious trouble. So that if a prospect wants to see who you are because you're selling a Cisco and they find three or four blog posts or they find an article or they find a LinkedIn post about how you describe how businesses can win, you've got their attention. If they see nothing on you, they're like, who is this person? This doesn't help me. Well, yeah, and if you take that all the way back for you know kids coming out of school that are looking for work is you, know, you have to start you know, yeah, maybe you don't know enough to you know, become a great blogger and in-depth expertise about a certain topic, but you have an area that you're interested in, you know, that you're looking for work in. You know, find the top 10 or 20 voices in that field, follow them on LinkedIn and Twitter, and start sharing, right? This is how you're going to learn as well. This is part of your education. This is how you're going to learn what's important in that field. Start sharing. And then you start building this network of people say, okay, I understand. Looking at what they share... This is, this is their digital footprint. This is what they're interested in. This is what they know. 
Yes, excellent suggestion. And, and, and engage with them, right? If you share a little comment, I like this, I thought this was good on Twitter, or you, um, you follow them on Quora, or you, you, know, you said things on their Facebook page, and whatever, you just engage with them, and that will take you somewhere. Right, what but that's, that's the entry level. But as you talk about yeah. in the book, eventually you have to get to the point where you're creating original content. Yes, and you know what's so funny? People seem to think they can't create content. And this is one of the things that I didn't talk about in the book, that if I could go back and rewrite, I would. Here's the deal. And people listen carefully because you're going to like this or not. If you can't create content, you suck at what you do. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm really sorry. I love it. <laughs> if, it really, like, if you don't know how, that's one thing. But if I put you in a room and I say, listen, just write about what you know and write something good. And if you can't do it, it's because you suck. And all you've done is go through life doing what you're told and following the rules. And, you, and the truth is you don't add value. But here's the good part. Those of us who actually understand and are experts in our field, we can write compelling things about how we do it. Our unique approaches to hiring, our unique approaches to promoting a gallery, our unique approaches to hanging out on the wall, our unique approaches to managing um, patients at my dentist's office who are afraid of the dentist, right? We all have, those of us who are good, all have very unique and special approaches that we can share. Even coming out of college, imagine we're coming out of college and whatever your field is, you've had to do papers that related to the field. Imagine doing a summary of your thesis or a summary of a final paper you had to do and you post that as a LinkedIn pulse. Yeah, right? or do a multi-part one, right, yes. exactly. Yes, I mean, as long as you have an original idea, as long as you can demonstrate that you're a thinker, which is also a chapter in here, that's a win. That's sharing, that's building your brand. Someone's going to read that and an employee is going to read that and be like, okay, I got this guy over here who's got nothing. I got this girl over here who's got something. And, ooh, that, was, that was a really cool breakdown of postmodernism, blah, blah, blah. I like that you've got their attention. Well, I think, right. I think the calculation that, that so many people make and young and old who are sort of confronted with this challenge of you know, creating this brand is that they think there's no value in what they have to say. And the thing is, it's not really... You can't know that until you put it out there. You can't be afraid of this, right? You have to do it. I mean, conservatively, what? There are probably about a trillion sales bloggers, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they all have unique things to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with all of them, but there may be people out there who do. Yes. So yes. Those, that's fine. That's great. Not everybody has to agree with you. Not everybody will. But it's out there. But it's, it's out so there. You have yes. to take the chance. Yes. If you don't take the chance, you said, if you're not... If you don't think you can't create content, not know how, but can't, then yeah, you're probably just a robot. And that, you know, that's an interesting thing too, is, is part of the process of going through my book is if you're honest with yourself and you're very self-aware and, you, and you're reading the create content and you're like, I don't know that I have anything, then let that be a wake-up call and, and skip right down to chapter 13 on deliberate learning and start realizing, wow, I really am not good at what I do. I don't have any original ideas. I couldn't teach somebody something new. I don't add value to my position. And damn it, that's going to stop today. And right. I'm going to go get better. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about this deliberate learning. We're going to take a short break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about this whole concept of deliberate learning and uh, the difference between like performance objectives. You're talking about performance achievement versus... Uh, Performance goals versus mastery goals. Versus mastery goals. Yeah, I'm sorry. Gosh, I blanked out for a second. Yeah, we talk about that because that's a great, a great concept that people should really resonate with. So, okay, we'll uh, be right back with my guest, Keenan. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a thousand companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on-demand service, which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. All right, welcome back. Here today with Jim Keenan, otherwise known as Keenan, a sales guy, author of this book, Not Taught, the new playbook, if you will, for success in the 21st century. I read it, really enjoyed it. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we're going to talk about mastery. 
So talk about this concept. You bring it up, and I, there are so many parts to it that I want to cover in the time we have because it, it really it resonates with me in the sense of, gosh, we just don't, we just don't encourage people to learn. No. In the workplace, we don't encourage people to learn. We think that if we just throw some training at them, that's all we need. Right. And statistics show, studies show, I give, put people in a room for eight hours and train them. 30 days later, they've forgotten virtually everything. Mm -hmm. So, so let's talk about this concept of mastery that you bring up. So deliberate learning was a, is a chapter 13, oddly enough, 13. Um, and I think it's probably one of the most powerful uh, chapters because it really has the ability to fundamentally change how you go about things. And, and basically what I say in deliberate learning is, most of us, again, because of the access information, notice the theme here, it constantly, this book constantly compares us to the industrial age in the 20th century and the information age in the 21st century. During the, the industrial age, again, access to information was much more constrained. You, you had, what are those, Encyclopedia Britannica is you had libraries and you had corporate training in schools. And that was it. So almost you almost always had to get your butt up and out of your house. And or you were restricted to what was in the in those encyclopedias sitting on the walk. Your family even had those, right? Mm -hmm. Now information is everywhere about everything at the at your fingertips. So back in the day, we stopped learning, most people, after college. Again, that's why college was so important. Now we have the ability not only to be constantly learning, we have the ability to be deliberate in our learning. And let me say that again. It's almost impossible not to learn. But those of us are deliberate say to themselves, I don't know this and I need to, so I'm going to learn it. And those who take a deliberate learning approach far out, um, outperform those who don't. And then what I say in that chapter is what you're asking about is this mastery orientation. Right. Mastery orientation. Yeah. So, so this is a thing found – this was based on a study done by Carol Dweck um, and, and Ellen Leggett. And what they realized is there are two types of goals that people can set. They can set a goal – and I'm going to use sports. I'm sorry for those who are into sports. It's just what works best for me. I'm going to set a goal to hit 10 home runs this year and bat 320. And then my brother said, I'm going to set a goal to learn how to hit the curveball – and to accelerate my bat speed by 10%, and, and, and that's his goal, okay? Mm -hmm. My brother is going to outperform me because his goal is associated with improvement. And learning. And learning, and by default, he will hit more home runs. By default, he will improve his batting average because his goal isn't performance-based. I, hey, I got 10 home runs. I'm freaking great. Hey, I batted 300. I'm great. It's I'm getting better. I just increased my bat speed by 10% and I learned how to hit the curveball. So now there's a pitch that I am not afraid of, but there's not a pitch that a pitcher can stump me with. Right. So if people begin to move away from these idea of goals, we talk about goals all the time of the successful. And it's I'm going to make a million dollars by the time I'm this. I'm going to be a billionaire by the time I'm 35. If you rather say I'm going to learn how to read a, uh, a spreadsheet and uh, I'm sorry, a, a P&L statement and a balance sheet and a cash flow. I'm going to learn how to determine a depressed company versus a, 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 a company with tremendous upside. I'm going to learn how to, right? And once you say those things and they're in a line with where you want to go, your probability of success goes through the roof because you really can't fail at those things. You just keep going until you get them. You see them as opportunities of growth. You see them as opportunities of learning. And their studies show that those with mastery goals, when they failed, saw them as learning opportunities and went and kept doing it. Those who had performance goals, when they failed, they saw it as a reflection of themselves. I'm not good. I suck. And they quit. Yeah, it starts becoming self-reinforcing, right? Yes. Well, so who's responsible for this, this learning? I mean, you talk about the goals being set that are learning goals versus... Performance goals. I mean, it sounds like these are goals set by employers. I mean, how do we change the types of goals that employers set? You can't change the type of goals employers can set, but you can change the goals you have that align with those. So, for instance, if you have an employer that notoriously sets high uh, quota goals, you should be asking yourself, when it comes to the entire sales process, where am I the weakest? Where are my where are my strengths versus my weaknesses? Am I am I a better closer, but I'm a terrible at the uh, at the cold call? Well, then guess what? I'm going to learn to be a better cold caller. 
I'm going to learn how to get people to call me back faster. I'm going to learn tips from like Jill Conrath on how to um, on a, how to write a value based email. I'm going to read Andy Paul's Amp Up Your Sales book because I'm going to get better at that piece. I'm going to learn that, right? And isn't but isn't there a role? I mean, this is one of my pet peeves or maybe passion projects, even if you will, is is it seems like though employers have abandoned teaching yes. by and large, right? So. Yeah, we're going to do this periodic training. We'll throw some crap at you. We'll hire somebody to come in and spend eight hours with you, you know, some outsider and so on. But but other than maybe the really large organizations, the largest enterprises, is employers have sort of abandoned this role of educating their employees. And it's like, it's they put it right on them. It's your, totally your responsibility. And I think, again, based on your point, grit, determination, hard work. I mean, gosh, no one taught me how to do a podcast. I had to go out and learn it, right? But, mm-hmm. but. You know, in an organization, it seems like if they had that chance to make that investment in this education, this mastery orientation, God, the ROI would be outstanding. It would be astounding. It absolutely would be. And my message is to organizations do that, right? But as you said in the beginning of the second half, the 21st century is making your success even more and more dependent on you. So anybody that's sitting around waiting for their company to train them better anybody that's sitting around waiting for better training from their company is just sitting on the in the caboose of the train to success right <laughs> I, I mean that's all there is to it well I mean, sitting in the boost of a train that always has one more car being put in front of it so it never gets to the finish line right it, amen amen i mean look absolutely i could go on a rant about how important it is for organizations to shift but to me that just seems like a, uh, a wasted breath I'd rather people read this book and, and when they're not getting that training from the organization, they know what they're missing. Now, notice what I just said right there because that's a key to deliberate learning, right? Is It is understanding what you're missing. You personally. Yes, you as the individual, you personally. And when you know what you're missing, you make a commitment to go get it. It's, the, it's your own personal development. It's filling your own voids. It's filling your own gaps of knowledge and expertise. All right. Great segue because that's the next part I want to get to is you talk about this you know, value of experience versus expertise. So let's talk about that. <laughs> Dude, you don't even want to get me going on that one. Uh. Exper- experience is the biggest pile of bunk junk that we have been pontificating forever. It is the worst fill-in for assumption that I can think of. Just because, and David Dunning, who I mentioned this a lot, the, the gentleman who did the study, the Dunning-Kruger effect, helped me coin a phrase. That it just got out what I've been trying to say after writing thousands and thousands of words. Somebody can have 20 years of experience in a mere two years of expertise, and somebody can have two years of expertise, and I'm sorry, two years of experience and 10 years of expertise. They do not correlate. You cannot get expertise without experience, but you can certainly get experience and not get expertise. So why? Like one of the, the blog posts I write that, that oftentimes get the biggest pushback is when I write about the need within a sales structure to hire people with expertise. And people reading that just go nonlinear. They go nuts. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, no. We need to hire generalists. We need to hire people that are broadly based, you know, People that are experts, they're closed-minded. They're not learners. I'm like, are you crazy? How do you think they got expertise? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't confuse expertise with a narrow knowledge base. Well, that's what people do. Isn't that's crazy, right? Yeah, that's that. No, that's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. Look, you, you need whatever. In your case, let's say hire somebody with a broad uh, understanding of the world, a broad uh, knowledge, or broad exposure. I'm all good with that. I'm all good with that. But depending on, I just got off a call with a client right now. Depending on what you're hiring for, you have to have some level of expertise. They have. You want them to do something, right? You, this is a set of things you want them to do. So if it's selling, I'm sure they have to have some expertise around cold calling, or some expertise around discoveries, or some expertise around demos. Notice I'm not saying experience, by the way. No but expertise, yeah, and some expertise around the customer and the people they're selling to. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. They have to, they have to some expertise, and so that's the key here. This is the message to people in this book. Don't folk, don't ever come to me. Don't ever, ever, ever come to me and say to me, "Oh, I've got ten years' experience." Because I'll tell you, I could give a rat's ass. What I want to know is what do you know, right? I have talked to people with. Uh, let me. I, I, well, I and, and I think, and I think, and I think that 
to tie, start tying pieces together here from our first episode, we talked about change and so on, is that expertise is the spur to innovation, which is the motivation of change, right? Yes. I mean, you need to innovate to change. That starts with expertise. Yes. I actually talk about this in one part of the book where I say, do you know how to tell if you're dealing with a, I think I use a doctor, but if you're dealing with a person with tremendous amounts of expertise versus someone with tremendous amounts of experience. And what I say is the person with experience is doing their job and they're doing it every day, but they're not changing anything. They're not the one who's creating the new tool for surgery. They're not the one who's created the new process. They're not the person who's added something to the profession. The experts add something to the profession. They're the ones who are pushing it because they have more knowledge than everybody else. So remember, I ask this question all the time, what have you created? And if this person can't tell me they've created anything, it tells me they lack the expertise I need. And it tells me they're simply people who rely on experience. They're just on autopilot. And they do what they're told to do. And they really don't have that much expertise. I see it all the time. Yeah. As, a, as a consultant, I've worked with people. When I go into organizations, they got 25, 30 years. They've been selling for 25 or 30 years. And they think they're the bomb. And I sit down. I set them in conversation. I start asking questions about how they did discovery, how this, and what's this, and what's that. And they look at me and they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, oh, my God. Perfect example. you got about five years expertise and a 30-year experience lifetime. That's a waste. Yeah, I, I, a great. I saw a speech that a guy gave a famous scientist that my wife was getting an award at the university she works at, and one of the other people getting an award was this world famous scientist and physician, and I think research, uh, I think neurologist, I think, if I remember correctly. And in, he said this thing in his talk that just I wrote down because well, actually I clicked it in my Evernote on my phone, but is because it was just so profound. He said, look, I'm in a great profession because I get to learn these amazing things every day. He says, but most importantly, I get to learn the same things over and over every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. he said, every day I talk with a patient, I get better at talking to a patient. You know, every mm -hmm. day I get better at diagnosing every day. So yeah, I may be on the cutting edge and I get to learn that stuff. But the thing that gives me the most pleasure is learning what I do and becoming more expert at what I do every day. And I thought, Wow. Wow. That is incredible. Yep. Yep. You just nailed it, right? So I, I write this chapter in the book to really push people, and that's where deliberate learning comes in, is to challenge themselves about really how good they are. Are you really emphasizing experience, or are you trying to emphasize expertise? And if you're relying on experience, it kind of goes back to the idea of being able to create content you don't have expertise. You are just relying on this, this simple idea of time. Because that's all you need. People hear me loud and clear. All you need for experience is time. You just have to not die. Yes. I think I said in the book, you just, you just have to not quit or not get fired or not die. And you've got experience. So if you're a salesperson for 40 years, you've got 40 years experience. But what does that really mean? Right? How much expertise do you really have? Do you have 80 years? Did you cram 80 years expertise in that 40 or just 10 or 15 and so right. I want people flipping because employers are getting hip to that. As we talked in your first section about Lazo Block and Google, they're getting really hip to this idea of experience and they don't want it anymore. Yeah. Tell me what you really – get to. let's get to the meat, peeps. Right. And experience, to sort of start tying up a, the show here, is one of your last points, which I really like this. Experience is boring. Yes. And you, and you say, don't be boring. Yes. Don't be boring. Guys, look – Everything, this, this, everything connects to everything in this book. All the chapters, reach, brand you, change, you know, deliberate learning, expertise, etc. And boring is part of it. If you're boring, nobody wants to be around you. And I'm sorry, are you ready for this? But most of you are boring. You are. You don't get out of your comfort zone. I just did something with Jeff Shore the other day. We did a podcast on this. And he calls the comfort zone addiction. Yeah, yeah, and I talked about that. It's great, isn't it? It's phenomenal. And, and you don't, so people listen, you don't like it, and you're probably going to be pissed at me. That means I'm doing something right, but you're boring. You, you, you dress like everybody else around you. You take on the same opinions. You, you don't do anything special. You don't get out of your, your um, comfort zone. So when I sit next to you on the plane, there's nothing about you that gets me to want to talk to you. There's nothing about me that really gets me connected. So when you sit and you write things, and, and you talk to employers and you, and you do your blog because you're going to start doing content, 
What, why do I care? Why do I care? You're boring. And so if you're boring, you can't build reach. If you're boring, you can't build um, a good brand. You. If you're boring, no one wants to spend time with you. It doesn't mean you can't have friends. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. This isn't about being a good person. This isn't about having friends. This is about attraction, the law of attraction, and being able to draw people to you. And I talk about that in the book. It's like, look, do things differently, right? Do things that will allow you to um, teach other people that will allow you to draw them to you so you have experiences, right? I say one of the things I say, get out of town. Right? How, how many people never leave the United States? How many people have only been to four or five states? How many people have never chased a bucket list, right? Just these little things, just like that. When I tell someone I'm a PSI level two ski instructor, like, oh my God, that's amazing. Really? You teach skiing? I didn't think it was that big of a deal, but people love it. And then they start asking me how to ski better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll go ski. Yes. Or when I when I tell people I climbed at the top of the pyramids, dawn and sat over over watched the sunrise over Cairo, like, oh, my God, no way. Hey, yeah, I'm a little crazy. Yeah, I'm a little energetic. But half of that comes from the fact that I just refuse to be boring. And I go out there and I build life experiences that I then share with the other rest of the world. And they want to know about it. They want to be close to me. And that's what being not boring is about. Building a persona that people are drawn to. They want to connect with. They want to talk, touch you and talk to you. And if you don't have that in the 21st century, you're creating another barrier. You're making it harder to be seen. You're making it harder to build a brain. You make it harder to build reach. And therefore, without those things, harder to move your career. Right. And on top of which, just have fun with it, right? As yeah. So people think, oh, they're experts. They're boring. Well, you know, experts... I think the ones that I know of that, that I most respect, they understand they don't take themselves that seriously. Yes. And I think that's one of the, and, and, I mean, they know that there are other smart people out there that have other things to add. And so they're not going to say, look, I know everything. I'm going to take myself really seriously. No one knows anything but me. It's really the opposite. That's, I think people become an expert by being open to new things that they can bring into their own level of expertise. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, I talk about, there, you're, you're really good, Andy. You're going through all the chapters. You're doing a good job. So I do talk about having fun. And I do it in a really – I didn't set out to do it this way, but it sort of turned out this way. It sort of was a combination of between having fun but also your outlook. And there was a study by Martin Seligman that I talk about in the, in the book that he went out and there was a company called MetLife that was hiring 5,000 salespeople uh, a year and spending – $30,000 every two years to train them. So that calculates out to $150 million every two years to train these salespeople. And only one in four were making it four years. And 50% were quitting after the first year. They were losing massive amounts of money. And to cut to the, make, cut to the quick, they brought in Martin Seligman and his, his studies on and testing for optimism. And they started testing these candidates for optimism. And they hired the candidates with the highest amount of optimism and the candidates who actually passed this little inside it, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, when someone can do something. Oh, what's the word? Uh, not a competence. Competence. Oh, thank you. They're, they're competence test, right? So if they pass the competence test, they got hired. If they pass the optimist test, they got hired. Or if they pass them both, they got hired. And what they found is those who were super optimists outsold everybody, including the people who passed the competency test. They outsold them. So this idea that I didn't have the competency to do the job and I didn't have this and that, they failed it, but they had super optimism. They outperformed everybody to the tune of 80-something percent by the second year. And so what the studies have shown is that success doesn't breed happiness. Optimism and happiness actually create success. And the data proves it. Very cool. Very cool. All right, Jim, I want to thank you for joining me to talk about your book. It's the end of our second talk. Make sure you go back and listen to the first talk and the first conversation we had about the book. Great book. How can people find out more about it? So it's on Amazon. Uh, it's Not Taught, uh, What It Takes to Be Successful in the 21st Century. You can go to nottaught.com. Uh, you can find it either place. It's pretty easy. All right. And there will be a link on the podcast page here for this episode, so you can click on that and take you there as well. So, Jim, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been a lot of fun to talk. And remember, everybody, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you achieve success. And subscribing to this podcast is an easy way to do that because then you'll make sure you don't miss any of our conversations with leading experts like our guest today, Jim Keenan, 
who share their experience and expertise, make sure I had that word in there, about how to accelerate the growth of your business. <laughs> so thanks for joining us. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.